Summer 2023 does not officially end until September 23. But really, don't most of us consider it over at the end of August and into the beginning of the month of back to school? I guess what I'm trying to say is the obvious. Summer is almost effectively done and it's now time to get back into serious learning mode. The new school year starting next Monday will bring new opportunities, new ideas, new relationships, new knowledge gained and even new challenges. Talking here now to Jamaica's future, what will you make of this next academic year? I wish you nothing but the best, whatever comes your way. I'm Adrian Atkinson. Welcome to Jamaica Magazine. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Thursday, August 31, 2023. Jamaica and Canada have signed a reciprocal recognition agreement that allows seafarers from both countries to legally work on ships sailing under the Jamaican and Canadian flags. The agreement was signed recently at the London headquarters of the International Maritime Organization, IMO. It was signed by Peter Brady, Director General of the Maritime Authority of Jamaica, and Joanna Manger, Director General of Marine Safety and Security at Transport Canada. Rear Admiral Brady tells JIS News that the agreement is a milestone for both countries' seafarers as well as their maritime and transport administrations. He points out that it increases opportunities and earning potential of seafarers trained and certified according to the Standards of Training, Certification and Watchkeeping STCW Convention. The agreement also authorizes Jamaica to verify the quality of education at Canada's maritime training establishments and vice versa. The Director General of Marine Safety and Security at Transport Canada says it allows her country to provide more job opportunities and help its domestic partners who are looking for qualified seafarers interested in working or living in Canada. The government will be launching a rural water resilience program in September as it moves to ramp up rainwater harvesting activities where and when appropriate. Minister with Responsibility for Water, Senator Matthew Samuda, made the announcement during a function at the Forestry Department on Tuesday. That program will be launched against the backdrop of the Prime Minister being able to table also our rainwater harvesting guidelines which will be gazetted and given to our planning agencies, the municipality, and indeed NEPA, to ensure that where appropriate, it is installed in the most appropriate manner. Acknowledging that not every Jamaican will have the resources to address the need for rainwater harvesting, Minister Samuda says this is why the government intends to distribute and install water tanks in 50,000 households over the next two to three years. He says social assessments will take place to ensure that the tanks go to the families most in need. But we're not just going to drop off a tank at a, at a house. We will be training young men and women from the communities to do the installations. So a part of our program will engage through the Hope and Heart programs. Young people at the constituency level and teach them basic plumbing. We'll teach them about rainwater harvesting. And we'll even start the process with the ones that excel to learn leak detection. Minister Samuda says government will also be providing the guttering and other infrastructure for these locations which will be mapped and put into the municipal corporations and NWC databases so that they are clear on where storage is available. In the meantime, a rainwater harvesting system and upgraded irrigation system have been commissioned into service at the Forestry Department. The rainwater harvesting system, which will serve the Forestry Department's head office on Constant Spring Road, was procured and installed at a cost of $9.1 million. It has four components, namely a catchment area on the roof of the property, a conveyance system comprising gutters and pipes, a storage facility that is a bank of plastic tanks, and a distribution system using a pump. The system is aimed at increasing the overall climate and disaster resilience of the forestry department by creating options for water capture, storage, and use. The new and upgraded irrigation system, meanwhile, was installed at the Mount Airy Nursery at a cost of $3.4 million. 
It will be used for sewerage and irrigation of the central germination facility and nursery, which has been facing water use challenges. This investment in the irrigation system of over $3 million will also protect Water Commission, but it will also optimize our use of that resource and ensure that we are turning out the volume of plants that we need from our nursery. It is anticipated that with the new systems, the Forestry Department will increase its production of seedlings and restore seedling beds. The government is taking steps to improve commuting in the corporate area with a proposal to relocate more public passenger coaster buses into the Halfway Tree Transport Center. Chairman of the Transport Authority, Owen Ellington, says the proposal is to relocate buses that traverse the Constant Spring and Red Hills route. The Transport Authority met with stakeholders earlier this week to discuss the proposal. Some weeks ago, an effort was made to um, relocate some of the coaster buses that normally sit down and pick up passengers along the roadways in the live lanes to the transport center. The assessment of that shows that it has been working pretty well and that there is um, capacity within the transport center to accommodate more buses. Mr. Ellington was addressing Wednesday's post-cabinet press briefing at Jamaica House. He says the transport center will provide a more safe and efficient commuting experience. The general idea is to prevent um, buses and taxis from stopping in and blocking live lanes as they seek to put down and, and pick up passengers, as well as to prevent um, commuters from having to walk long distances and cross the street, um, oftentimes putting their safety at risk. Meanwhile, more public transport improvements for the halfway tree area will include the construction of additional taxi stands and the reconstruction of safety guardrails along the roadways for pedestrians. Education Minister Favel Williams is asserting that there are more available teachers for employment than the school system requires, as she addresses the impact of teacher resignations. During a press conference on Wednesday, the minister revealed that 854 teachers had left the public sector between January and September of this year. While this represents a 44% decline when compared to the same period in 2022, the minister acknowledged that this still poses a challenge for the sector. Ahead of the school year, um, obviously getting notice here um, a few days before school opens, uh, I can fully understand the uncertainty of our principals or boards across Jamaica, um, but, but um, that is why at, at least two, three weeks ago, we published, we sent to our schools a number of different strategies for them to use to help with the recruitment process. According to Minister Williams, there are approximately 25,000 teachers in schools across the island and an available pool of almost 1,700 teachers to be employed. She outlined some of the strategies put in place for teacher recruitment. Boards were given pre-approval to make early recruitment decisions. Um, they were given approval to engage part-time teachers, to engage retired teachers to engage pre-trained graduate teachers, to engage final year student teachers, um, to redeploy uh, uh, underutilized staff, to merge small classes, to use blocked timetable approach, to increase the use of information communication technology in the classroom. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. I said it's time for serious business, right? You know what's serious? Having your learning cut short because of negative actions. Are you prepared to pay the often lifelong penalty for such a move? Luckily, there is a way out. The Dispute Resolution Foundation has a program to keep students on the path of peace and learning. Our journey unfolds in different ways, different paths trodden by the unique worlds and ridges of our footprints. For some, that journey will never make contact with the wrong side. 
while for others, conflict will become a reality, even as a child. That's where the Dispute Resolution Foundation's School Suspension Intervention Program, SSIP, comes in, making help available for both children and parents. The Dispute Resolution Foundation provides a safe space for children where they can freely express themselves. So here they are not judged or accursed or bashed or any such thing. So that makes it easier for us to find the underlying issues that need addressing. So the school suspension intervention program emerged in 2006 as a result of the growing surge of crime and violence in the Spanish Town community. To support education officers or educators and persons who work with young people. And the service we provide is a rehabilitative program for students who are at a risk of suspension, those who have been suspended. That's our main focus here in the SSIP. First of all, we have to have a referral. The referral may come from educational institutions. It may also come from, let us say, the family court or CPFSA. Once we receive that referral, we engage the student in an intake session followed by one-on-one -on -one session, after which they will join the psychoeducational group sessions. Following that particular session, we have another one-on-one -on -one session. At this point, there are times where we see the need to invite parents and other family members or those a part of the conflict that probably um, led to the student being referred to us in the first place. After that second one-on-one -on -one session, we oftentimes do a post-assessment that will help us to put together our release letter. Now, at the time that we'd be putting together this release letter, of course, there may be an opportunity to refer to another external agency, for example, Child Guidance Clinic. Apart from that, however, we will engage in follow-up sessions with the students. After 15 years of successful operation, the doors of opportunities that the program has opened to children who are at risk of suspension or those who have been suspended has certainly been something to talk about. Students are a bit reluctant at times on their first day, especially because they never really see the need for them to be here as the stigma attached to the program is that, you know, bad picnic, come this side and all of that. But after they understand the program, you know, it's explained to them and what they'll achieve here, they never want to leave at the end. And that certainly sounds accurate especially as it aligns with the testimonies of Nicholas Golding and Shamar Steele, now reformed thanks to the program. My principal introduced me to the program. Well, I was introduced to the program because of some late going to school and some trouble that I was given at school. So I was placed here to get around certain edges that need to be led to it. I got into a fight with one of my classmates, then get suspended. And the principal ended up similar in her program, learning to control my anger, and hopefully have a certain bad situation. Well, it helped in a majority of ways because it helps me to counteract with others on a better level, or to deal with disputes that involve being under control and how to react to certain people and how to walk away from certain things that is unnecessary. Some of the things that they use to help me is one-on-one -on -one sitting down with me, helping me to go through certain emotional problems and how to deal with certain problems. They teach me how to control my anger and teach me effective techniques how to manage my anger, like walk away and take a deep breath or just think about something different and relax my muscle and how to resolve conflict between me and my peer or someone else. Since I've been through so much and I end up start doing movies based on my situation, my movie them, I write them on things that I learn. All of these positive changes is really because I was in the program. I would encourage other persons in a similar situation to join the program because they can learn how to control their anger, avoid certain bad situations, put themselves in any trouble, 
I learned to resolve conflict between them and their parents or their peer or family members. I would encourage others to be a part of the program because this program helps you in a lot of ways, emotionally, physically, all type of ways that you think that many others, you cannot talk to them about certain things, but these people give an ear to your problem. We have some marvelous response. We have such life-changing opportunity for them. This is their second chance program. We've had moments where students, literally, we are still mommy, daddy, uncles, and aunties for many, even years after exiting the program. Imagine that, they'll still come back wanting to give their time to other students in terms of mentorship. So it's a lifelong relationship that we build with them, which I think speaks to the impact of the program on these beneficiaries. We've seen how the DRF school suspension intervention program changes the lives of students. Now it's time for the parents' perspective. We don't get a lot of people who are our students who are not satisfied parents. The major issue for parents, though, is that they wish their children could come back to the program after their suspension period has ended. For some parents, they too bear the burden of a child often caught in the unfortunate situation of school suspension. But those who've opted to make use of the Dispute Resolution Foundation School Suspension Intervention Program have seen some incredible responses. Take, for example, Garfield here. My name is Garfield Wana. My daughter gets introduced to the school suspension intervention program. Why sending daughter to school, daughter going out good and thing, and after she's reaching a 9, 10 grade to start for a company, then after that, everything does start going on a different road. You understand? We have to step in as a daddy and make sure it's everything all right to die. So, so now we get in the juice to the program. God sent. It's a God sent program. That's what we tend to get from our parents. And they too, whenever they're having any issues at all, it could be with their colleagues, they are calling to access the program. We actually have programs for our parents, such as the parent sensitization. So they too benefit from this service that we offer. After being a part of the program, the first half, she was skylarking. After the program and such, then she step up. She left school with a couple of subjects and things. I would encourage other parents to send them children to the program. Things start from a tender age and all things going right now. Everybody smaller is exposed to everything. They come in the movie, they come in the songs. They come around the communities. So, which that program is a good program. So, if as a parent or guardian, Garfield's story sounds anything like yours, then feel free to reach out to the Dispute Resolution Foundation. We can provide that listening ear. We will also advise you and make referrals where necessary. Parents, feel free to reach out to us if you feel overwhelmed as well, because we know raising children, we don't get a manual to do that. So it's a bit tedious and we learn as we go. So let us help each other. Feel free to reach out to us and we will do our best to assist you. Parents, if you have children at home, and you are noticing any maladaptive behavior, they are not listening to you, um, they are not talking as much, eating as much, any form of abnormal behavior, and I mean behavior that you don't normally see them with, do not be afraid to reach out to the Dispute Resolution Foundation. For the school suspension intervention program, the numbers supported are high, the commitment remains steadfast, and the tools are available and always ready to assist even for parents. My hope for the program is really the end goal is to see a peaceful culture. So I want improved communities and improved livelihoods for our students. That is what I hope to see and I hope that will be impactful for years to come so that this can be achieved in the end. 
that is the mandate of the Dispute Resolution Foundation. Well, first of all, we have to have a referral. The referral may come from educational institutions. It may also come from, let us say, the family court or CPFSA. After the referral is made, an intake session is done, followed by a one-on-one -on -one session, then a psychoeducational group session, and another one-on-one -on -one session. A post-assessment is then conducted to help put together a release letter with an opportunity to refer students to another external agency where necessary. And then, follow-up sessions are conducted. This is a program that gives you and your child a second chance. Take us up on this offer. For further information, visit the Dispute Resolution Foundation's website at www.drfja.org or contact them at 876-906-2456 or 876-908-3657 or you can send them an email at drf at drfja.org. Caller, you are now on air. Okay, so I recently graduated from high school and I'm nervous about what's next. Some motivation would help. All right, caller, we have just what you need. What you are getting today is a passport to the world. And you are going to decide how high your plane will fly. Because even though you have a passport, it doesn't mean that there won't be turbulence in the sky and some scary moments where you have to hold on to your seat and have faith that you will make it. I want you to remember the five important P's that helped me to be successful. Positivity, perseverance, professionalism, progressiveness, and having a prosperous spirit. I can guarantee you that if you follow that template in life, you will be successful. September, tomorrow, does not only have to be a time of change for students. Us working adults may also use the change in the seasons to revisit how we go about the business of employment and funding our lifestyles. If you missed our recent Get the Facts discussion on Flexi Week, Here's a highlight of some of the key takeaways. I like definitions, and I want you to give me two. First off, well, one definition and then an explanation. Okay. What is flexi work? So flexi work relates to that non-standard um, engagement on employment. So it relates to the fact that workers are now being engaged outside of a standard work week. What is the standard work week? Oh. It is normally um, five days per week mm -hmm. and a maximum of 40 hours per week. So a flexi work arrangement can have more days, more time, or arrangements that modify um, how the worker either um, goes to a physical place right. of work or not. So you'll have some persons do uh, what we call telework, telecommuting. We have that a lot because we right. have a very vibrant, what we call BPO, global services sector. So tell me, what are the different types of flexi work arrangements? All right, so I should start by saying the Employment Flexible Work Arrangements Act mm. um, came into effect in 2014. Right. And this governs how it operates. And what it provides for is a situation where you can have a compressed work week. Mm. So some of us, oh, we would just want to just get through the 40 hours and go on to something else. Right, right. And it allows for that. So persons are allowed to work a maximum of 12 hours per day at single time pay. Mm. And then they will be clearing that 40 hours in less days than the standard five days. Uh, Additionally, another way that flexi work week happens is where a person say, you know something, I want to work the way I want to work. And I can okay. tell you the Gen Z and whatever is the other names that they right. call him by. 
um, they want to just do um, part-time work. So the Flexible Work Arrangements Act also allows for that. And globally, you find that organizations want to be operating 24 hours because it's catering to clientele that wants the organizations to be open. And you also have um, the, the flexible arrangements where persons are on staggered shifts so that uh, the organization is literally open 24 hours, 24-7, ah, right. as we would say. Right. And also, you have flexible arrangements where we work on it, gig work at one point. Right. I mean, when you want to work, you can take a contract with a company and you just do that work and then you're gone again. Okay. You know, you have a lot of that. Um, some people call it um, consultancies, lots of different variations in the names. But right. it's all called flexible work arrangements. So, will an employee lose uh, any entitlement such as vacation or sick leave if they accept flexi work arrangements? So that's a very interesting question. And actually, Theodore, is one of the most asked questions. Well, there we go. <laughs> Let's get the facts. So in terms of vacation leave, um, a worker earns one day vacation leave for mm. every 22 days worked. Okay. So clearly, if you're working less days, you would actually earn your vacation leave at a slower pace. Well, it doesn't cut down so doesn't your allotment. Down. No, <laughs> it doesn't okay. cut down your allotment. Okay. And actually, um, what we recognize with flexible work arrangements is that the workers and employers come to an agreement mm -hmm. so that there is no loss. Right. You know, so the employment contracts, they actually give a more generous arrangement sometimes than the law says. Mm -hmm. In relation to sick leave, it's a similar situation. Um, the Holidays with Pay Act deals with sick leave as well. Right. And what it says is that for the first 110 days, if a worker becomes sick, they get the leave, but not with pay. So mm. in, a, in a flexible work arrangement, it is the same that thing. Holds. Right. So it is after the worker has cleared the first 110 days of work mm -hmm. that they will start earning um, the right to be paid if they are sick. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll toss one more on the pile. You'll probably hear about this as well. Overtime, public holidays, flexi work messes with that. All right, so overtime, um, gone are the days when you work eight hours and everything after that eight hours on that day is overtime. Oh, gone are the days. So, so sad. What the Flexible Work Arrangement Act does is to say that for the first 12 hours, mm -hmm. you can be paid at a single time rate. Right. And once you have done more than 12 hours on that day, that is when a premium time is attracted, or if you do more than 40 hours per week. Okay. And I want to quickly say that a lot of employers sometimes ask this question, whether uh, there is a public holiday that falls in that week. Okay. Um, how is that treated? Right. So the quick answer is if the person worked the day immediately preceding or immediately succeeding mm -hmm. um, the public holiday, and they would have normally worked on a public holiday, right. then they are to be paid okay. if they are a worker. Okay unless there's some other hybrid arrangement, but normally they will be paid in those circumstances. It sounds like the employer. And if an employee is not sure, yeah. always call the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. This is where Jamaica Magazine ends, but only for today. Of course, another one is being prepared for tomorrow. View it here or on our website at gis.gov.jm. We share so much more there. So take note of the link on screen and visit the site that's updating you daily on issues of national importance. I'm Adrian Atkinson. On behalf of the entire production team, thank you so much for tuning in and see you next time. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.